When I talk about Taylor Swift, I say it's, it's so obvious to me. She's the perfect vehicle to go to those low propensity uh, white liberal women. And, and by the way, we can do this as well. We don't have a Taylor Swift on our side, but you know who we have? We have Kid Rock, we have Ted Nugent, we have influencers, right? We have all these people, John Voigt, we have people that can come out and use their audiences, number one, and, and, and I want an army of Scott Presslers at every Kid Rock event and every Ted Nugent event. And I hope, by the way, and I, I need to talk to those guys about this because I've got this idea. Bill Crystal, <laughs> we always like to keep you on your toes. Welcome to Ballot Box with Bill and Tim. Uh, Bill, is John Voigt still alive is my first he, question he for is. you. Is he, uh, is he on the mortal coil? That's that's harsh. I don't know. I met him when I was still like ten years ago, maybe in the Fox Green Room when I was in that world. Um, I think he is. I think he's with us, and I hope he stays well and healthy. But I do. I hope he stays well. And I don't healthy. think he quite has Taylor Swift's reach. I mean, I, who am I to say though? I'm out of touch with popular culture. You know, maybe there's a <laughs> massive number of John Voigt fans who are slightly not quite as you know obvious or prominent as Taylor Swift. Yeah, fans. I think you it's think? pretty clear just by looking at the su- Spotify listens that t- at least that ted new ted nugent's more of an apples to apples comparison I think, I think it's pretty clear that he's not there interesting that's my friend pizzagate jack P- uh posobiec i don't know if you know him but uh he's a prominent figure on the right um I- i'm sure everybody watching this has been very familiar about the taylor derangement syndrome that's happening on the right that ab stoddard wrote about um ably in the bulwark this morning uh but i, I thought it was worth just talking a little bit about I, it's one thing for Jesse Waters, cable news grifters. Is, the primary is not interesting. These guys got to fill, fill, fill an hour. You know, that speech, that's from the Turning Point Action event today. And this is from, you know, the Trump wing of the party, right? We had a grassroots activism kind of a, a gathering in, in Las Vegas today. And, and several of them were bringing this up, this psyop that's happening with Taylor Swift. What what the I I guess that's my question, Bill. I don't know if you can see my face if you're listening your on the podcast yeah, no, feed. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I myself I discussed this with Wycliffe Jean on Friday before <laughs> in the green room before I being on Harry Melver. Did you like that deaf that deaf? I did. I did the Fugees. Did you get did you get into the Fugees? What the Fugees? You know, right? We actually, I, you know, it's funny. I don't really know much about him to be honest. Though I of course met up on him a little bit, and it seems like a fine fellow. But I hadn't realized. So I. The, Ari asks on Friday if you like your outrage of the week, basically a fallback Friday, he calls it. And I, I, without even thinking about him and him being from Haiti and having a, it was his group, right, called the yeah, Fugees. The Fugees I, mean, yeah. I, I, my outrage was Governor Abbott in Texas, you know, with the barbed wire and then defying mm-hmm. the federal government and stuff. So that was a good, uh, that was good luck that he was, he was very, he's pro refugee. So I guess what I should have known that from the name of his group, which, but I should have known the name of his group, but I'm kind of out of touch with <laughs> I feel culture. So what, anyway, I'm pro. So what did Wyclef think pro- about the uh, about the yeah. Taylor Swift uh, drama? I'm pro Wyclef Jean and I'm pro Taylor Swift. Why are they? So you tell me. You're more a better analyst of this than I am. Mean, why are they obsessed with jealous of, resentful of yeah. t- Taylor Swift? And I mean, so what's going I, on? I, so I got to tell you, I get. I really do understand the resentful, grievance, jealousy element of it. Right? There's a misogyny element to this. Of course, there is a. Everything comes back to the high school cafeteria. I'm a very uh, like the high school cafeteria of life theorem is is something that I strictly abide to. And you know, I mean, it's the pretty girl, it's the prom girl, and the face and the football player. You know, uh, the handsome football player. Right? So there's a, an element of that, the jealousy, the um, the you know dominant culture. Uh, uh, the, kind of this, there's always this element of the right. There's always the world that daily element of the right, but now it's kind of subsumed the right. This, you know, you have to be counterculture. You have to be against whatever, you know, wherever the trends are going. Um, so that's, I, I, I do understand all that. I mean, it's, it's preposterous. Like the theory that it's an op is ridiculous, but, but to blanch against those two, like makes sense in a MAGA media setting right like this is what ben shapiro's whole you know uh, da- the whole daily wire ecosystem exists on this to like be like we are counter the the liberal cultural hegemon hegemony um the grassroots side of it though is what i don't i really can't figure and i and i think that the best answer i have is i think that they have convinced themselves 
that Taylor Swift is a real threat and that this is some effort to neutralize it. And the reason why I say that is um, when I was at uh, the Turning Point USA thing interviewing people, uh, Taylor kind of came up. This was before all this. I mean, obviously she's you know in, in the news and in pop culture, but it was before it like really hit this fever pitch in political world. And a couple people said to me, yeah, I'm just I'm worried about the women and the turnout that's going to happen, you know, with women, with young white women, with Roe and with Taylor Swift and that they're going to activate them. And that might be the one thing that keeps us out of power. I mean, I, I literally heard people in the around the band and war room world uh, make that point. And so I, I think it's possible that they've just psyched themselves out to such a degree that they think that this is a big Achilles heel and, and, and as such, they need to like respond to it in some way. And they're responding it to, to it in the most, you know, in the, in, in a way most suited for lunatics imaginable. So that that's the best exclamation ex, explanation I got for you. No, that's good. I mean, I, I think that last part is what's interesting. That is, I suppose it's not crazy to worry that major cultural figures are kind of on the other side. She's not that political, but I think she endorsed Biden in 2020 and did yeah. a little turnout stuff. And, He's like he did an ad for I don't know what he's like pro vax right so that's really uh, Kelsey yeah Travis yeah. Kelsey uh, yeah crazy. did an ad for Pfizer and so I mean it's it's crazy we're doing a pharmaceutical company ad now code you left yeah isn't that it's crazy, been right? a long and, it's a long strange trip where we've been on yeah but being a billionaire which I take it she probably yeah. is being a, an NFL football star and doing a pharmaceutical company I <laughs> did three more mainstream <laughs> I'm gonna say center right American Central. things I mean. I'm old enough to remember the left didn't like the NFL much. They didn't yeah. like the concussions. They weren't crazy about that, incidentally, you know, and, yeah. and all that. They didn't like pharma. Uh, um, uh, it was the left that didn't like pharma. And, of course, you know, and they had a suspicion of kind of middle brow pop, popular culture. Right? Yeah, it's particularly like, oh, middle brow Americana country ish type, which is like where she started. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Been kind of comfortable yeah. with capitalism, yeah. and, as you say, Americana. And now the right thing is, I think that is revealing. It is an anti-American right in some ways, or anti-current America right. It yeah. really does bring home, I don't know how grassroots it is, I don't know how to do it, but it sort of brings home how much they like in America, a fictitious America that didn't even exist then, but of 1955 or something. And they really dislike anything that is big, you know, successful, uh, popular almost in, in current America, unless it's from in their little, not little, in their big subculture of current america you know yeah i read about i, I wrote about this um it was one of my anytime i write about music it's my least read items on the bulwark.com so I've, i'm going to reshare it now uh but i went to Lollapalooza, brazil like maybe last year or two years it was my uh, gift to myself went yeah, after the that. covid lockdown and you know there's some brazilian acts and some brazilian food there but but like it's it was really american right like the main acts were all from america the the concessions of like you know Budweiser and Domino's and you know Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, like literally, it was it was if you felt like you're an American mall there when you're going to the concessions, and I, you know it. And the Brazilians were all super into that, right? And it it like occurred to me when I was talking about this that that, that this is now like anathema to Mac, right? Like none of these big big acts are like the the idea that. You know, what was kind of the stereotypical right wing Reagan era? Oh, you know, you Americans are so brash and you're exporting McDonald's all over the world and you're imperialists and all this. It's like the, like MAGA doesn't like that anymore. Like they don't like any of these people, any of these musicians. Um, they don't they don't like the fact that it's uh, it's very diverse. You know, that all, you know, like the, one of the main uh, musicians I saw there was Doja Cat, who's this like, you know, kind of mixed race Jewish woman. Right. Like they don't they're not like all of that. They're hostile to. And and I think that the, it, there really is like an el a strain of it, an element that's like, well, I like America in the vague sense, but I don't like America as it really exists. Yeah. And that anti-American element of it, you know, is like it, that strain ties through everything, right? Like why you could want to overthrow the government, why we don't trust, you know, any of these people. So I don't know. I just, I guess my last thing on this is like, do you, I mean, there's always a jealousy, you know, among, at like the RNC convention, you know, over the years that like the celebrities were bad, right? Like that, there was always like a little bit of latent jealousy there and, and you know, some great bitterness towards, like, do you remember anything like this? Just like, like such a deranged 
response. So, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this as I was coming in from DC to do this from home uh, half an hour ago, having uh, uh, some dinner there. And, and I was thinking, you know, it's just, just that question. And actually, you know, weirdly, so I was Dan Quayle's chief of staff, and Dan Quayle gave a slightly famous speech in 1992, which was a sober speech about the causes of riots and family breakup and all this. But he foolishly, I suppose, we uh, used uh, sort of one example from pop culture where Murphy Brown, which was then a very popular TV show, which of course I hadn't really seen, so I was like clueless about it, had had a baby out of wedlock. And it was treated as kind of a joke on the show, kind of a lighthearted thing. And he was making a point that their the prospects aren't as good and we should be more serious about the culture of marriage. I mean, it was very, t- but what struck me is it was earnest. It was probably ill-advised. Candace Bergen, who played Murphy Brown, made fun of Dan Quayle. I'm not sure, I don't think we necessarily won that showdown. But, <laughs> um, but that was sort of like a, you know, a kind of polite little jibe at Hollywood for being, you know, lefty on, on social and cultural values right. and, and making light of a sort of old fashioned bourgeois, or whatever, you know, uh, uh, sense of the family and all this. That was kind of what the right, that was our idea of taking on Hollywood. And you know, we didn't think, I mean, now we're so far beyond that in terms of, well, it was not even comparable, right? The craziness, the hostility, the vitriol, the conspiracy theories. The, the, there was nothing, you know, it was like a totally different. Uh, so that struck me as. I'm glad you brought that up because, well, A, it's, it's 32 years ago. So far, right? I'm yeah, sorry. it's 32 years ago. They've learned nothing, right? So for starters, like as you said, like that was not a big winner for Dan Quayle. So you've learned, learned, learned nothing over 32 years about picking these fights. But the other, the d- key difference there is like, whatever you, to, whatever you think about that policy critique, not really for me, uh, but that like shouldn't have. I, it was a pot. It was it was a it was a right. substantive thing. It was literally, it was like, hey, we should be trying to encouraging kids that have to have two parents, and like that's better for outcomes. Yeah. it was two sentences at a thirty-minute speech that quoted James Q. Wilson, the political scientist, and about right. family. Yeah, what everyone thinks of it is that it was earnest and it was using the Holly and Hollywood was a little bit of a whipping boy really for for conservatives at the time they were out of touch they were wealthy liberals but it was such a conventional critique of a kind of limousine liberalism let's call it and you know uh i think candisburg was sort of well known to be to be a, a, a liberal a democrat but again it was nothing there was, no, there was nothing like the personal attack the kind of you know and, and nothing of the conspiracy theories they're out to get us this is an op that is the amazing part and do you think that goes deep that people really believe that this is a deep state yeah. operation. This is like I do. I I I don't think that they really know what it means, right? And um, you know, again, just just to close the loop on the on the Candace Bergen thing, right? Like that's what's missing here, right? Like there's no substantive. Like I don't like Taylor Swift because she sang about this. Like, or, I well, guess just, the closest right. thing is that Travis Kelsey did the the. I guess we're against vaccines now, so I guess the closest substantive criticism is anti-vax, right? But there's no policy criticism, and then the conspiracy. There's no, there, there, like they they can't even offer a, like what exactly the conspiracy is right like vivek or somebody's out there like they're helping the chiefs win which is preposterous the chiefs have been four of the last six super bowls like and but then then it's like why and to what end and and what are you know what are they doing so i i don't i don't think that people i don't think that your average person listening like has thought about it deeply enough to really think Yes, Joe Biden and Roger Goodell and George Soros and Taylor Swift all met and they're like, we're going to pick this handsome football player. We're going to, you know, I don't think they really think that, but I do think that they think that forces vaguely defined are out to get them. Right. And and that includes the government and includes the most popular celebrities in the world. And it even includes football players now and includes big pharma. And there's something happening that they don't like. And, and, I, and I think that that is sunk in with people. Yeah, the '90s. The other criticism like that, I guess. Now that we think about it, is the tip of gore, obscene yeah. lyrics, and it's bad for kids. And again, what everyone thinks of it, maybe it's overdone, but you know, it was like a normal, you might say, culture. There was a normal cultural conservative reaction to, not always correct, but understandable to, I don't know, changes in the culture into Hollywood. Sure. This is not normal. This is like goes out of its way to be insanely conspiratorial. And that seems important to it. And I guess that's what I'm saying. That, and I don't know if, if 2 million people believe this or 20 million or 60 million. I don't think most, you know, from supporters believe it or maybe care about it. But but it is it shows I don't know. But somehow the whole conspiracy side of it, they're they're out to get you side of it. Yeah, not they're foolish. That's very bad for kids to see this and 
it's wrong and they're too cavalier about the effects of it, but they're out to get you and it's all a massive conspiracy. That is really, always was important, I guess, for, for Trump to some degree, but has really become so central to the 2024 version of Trump and MAGA, I think. Yeah. And that's and what Trump and MAGA. I mean, Trump himself stays away from that stuff. A MAGA. I, th I think that it's, mil it's millions. It's definitely millions of people. Again, not necessarily millions of people that believe, I specifically think Taylor Swift plotted with Joe Biden, but that believe that these people are out to get us and they're, they're machinations that I can't see right. and they're doing this. And I do think that's central to Trump. And I do think, as you talk about very often about the contingency of leadership, like leadership does matter. Who is in there does matter. Like, like, yes, there would be cons crazy conservative talk radio hosts saying crazy conspiratorial shit, no matter who was the Republican nominee. Right. But Trump's just like, not a, like it almost understates it to say it creates a permission structure. He like, he fans the flames of it. Right. Like it is, it is central to his ethos. He pushes it. And he makes it much easier. Like, you don't have to, like, if you're Vivek, I don't have to, you know, if the party was being run by Mitt Romney, you would feel very concerned that you would be chastised and have your hand slapped and not likely to get a cabinet position or whatever he wants. If you're going out there saying that Joe Biden is rigging the NFL because of some blob, something, 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 Travis Kelsey took a Pfizer shot, right? If Mitt Romney was going to be the Republican nominee, you would not send that tweet because you want to go up the ranks you don't have that same concern. Like you, as you, as you assess Trump, you think I, maybe this helps me. Like this could actively, like at worst it is neutral at best it actively helps me. And I, and I think that that, you know, that is how he kind of enables and exacerbates the culture of this crazy talk. Agreed. So yeah. there you go. All right. That's fine. Taylor Swift. Um, I wanted to get to you also on, um, uh, the full Liz, our friend Ala Pundit uh, over at uh, the Dispatch, uh, wrote a newsletter uh, yesterday that I liked. Ala Pundit's awesome if you don't read him. Um, and he referenced a article that uh, our friend Michael Wood, who ran for Congress in Texas, another good man, um, wrote for The Bulwark about how Nikki Haley should in these last, what do we got here? Four, we still have four weeks. This is going to be the longest South Carolina ever. Um, uh, in the last few weeks until South Carolina, that that Nikki Haley just kind of let the gloves off that uh, essentially do the, what Liz Cheney did. Speak the truth about Trump, rip off his face. You know, there's you got nothing left to lose. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Michael. Uh, he, he made this argument in a much more Churchillian and, and sober minded and, and, and uh, convincing way than I just did. But, but that was the gist of it. Allah um was you know and then then there's the other half of the other side of the coin which is you know your carl roche your republican pundit class that's like ross douthat wrote about this in the new york times like nikki should really try to win and and she should not attack trump or not do anything that might hurt her standing with trump voters and you know she should do whatever it can to to increase her vote percentage like four points and um, Allah took like a middle ground and said, well, maybe she can go to the half list, right? Like maybe the right thing to do is, is, is kind of what she's been doing. Be more aggressive towards Trump. Try to strike a middle ground. Don't really pull your punches. Uh, but, you know, don't go out there and make arguments that make you sound like Bill Kristol and Tim Miller on MSNBC, right? So um, he didn't say that per se, but again, that was, that was the gist of the advice. So, so on, on those categories, how do you assess what Nikki Haley should be doing here in the final 24 days between South Carolina, between now and South Carolina. Yeah, I'm with Olive Hunter. I guess now writes under his actual name, not his. Not oh, that's his. a good point. He does. Nick Cataggio. Nick Sorry, Cataggio, yeah, right. he's he long held, you know, a, a pen name for, for, for his blog and for his post. Um, I'm, I'm sort of for that. I, I, I'm more sympathetic to the half Liz as a tactic than I think I was a few weeks ago where I thought, you know, you just, got to do as much damage to Trump and the only way to do that is to tell the truth and just to call him out totally. But, you know, I, she's done this very somewhat tentative step by step going from really almost no criticism to some muted criticism to, you know, he really is past problems and, you know, he's, he's kind of doddering old guy and also, uh, and then going a little tough on him. I think the jury was right in the trial. 
JBL had a terrific uh, newsletter today sort of making fun of Nikki Haley for a month ago. She had no opinion on this trial. She hadn't followed it. And now she thinks the jury has made the right decision. And Nikki really studied up a lot on the evidence and the rules of civic, civil procedure or something in the last one. And you can make fun of her, but I think it's a little unfair and a little, and I think she's doing more damage, I've got to say, with this step-by-step uh, approach. I, I think she could be doing more damage to Trump than I would have expected. I, I hope she gets as many votes as possible in, in South Carolina while criticizing him, but I'm not quite wi willing to be quite as judgmental about how far she goes in criticizing him because her staying in, the longer she can stay in, which for me means getting 35, 40% of the vote in state after state. I don't think she'd be expected to drop out if she can get that percentage, at least of Super Tuesday. I just think it does get more voters, independent voters, and some chunk of the Republican voters, used to not voting for Trump and in a way voting against Trump, you know, and I think that makes them more available to desert, to be persuaded to desert Trump in the general election. So I think she's doing good for the answer for the anti-Trump cause. Uh, I don't think she'll be the nominee, but I, I wish her well and I hope she does well in South Carolina. A lot of independents come over and vote for her there. And in the subsequent, there are a lot of open primaries on Super Tuesday, assuming she does well enough in South Carolina to, to last till Super Tuesday. Um, and I don't worry quite as much as JBL does that she'll end up endorsing Trump and that will undo all the damage she's done. I, I don't think that's really the way it works. If you're really in a state where she's campaigning against Trump, the nominal endorsement, I don't think it really makes up for it any more than Kennedy's of Carter did. So maybe, I'm, I'm probably being excessively optimistic about the damage that he can do, but I, but you know, compared to what, right? I think it, it's I just, worth taking I a just, shot. We, we need kind of a happy juice sponsor for this thing, but I just <laughs> want to know what Bill Crystal's on some weeks. Cause it was like last week we were together during the New Hampshire primary, you were down, it was, just, it was the end of the Republic. And here we are trying to, <laughs> trying to really shine this turd. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I guess I'll take the last part of this because I don't really think it matters. I was, I, I think if people have not read Michael Wood's article on the bulwark.com, you should go check it out and, and sign, yeah. up for the, sign up for our fees. We have a lot, ton of free stuff there. Um, it's, it, you've got good email newsletters from JVL and, and, uh, and others when we have uh, interesting articles. Uh, we'll get them to your in your in your inbox. And and Michael Wood's piece was, I thought, compelling about why Nikki should just speak the truth about Trump. I, I I'm okay with the argument that maybe dialing it back a little bit um, for political ends, you know, in order to extend her campaign um, has some value. I don't, I don't know that I share your view about the endorsement though. I, I, I don't think it's a huge, massive deal if Nikki Haley endorses them, but the, but the manner in which she does and how she said and what, how she talks about it, you know, um, I think does matter. And I, and I think that yeah. in, in the, hopefully we're not in this place, but in a, in the bad place scenario where Trump really does gain with non-college voters of color, you know, non-college men, really Hispanic and black men. Um, and, uh, Michael Woods texting us. I know we can do this on the live stream. Yeah. I called you Churchillian. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, I, if if Trump does gain in that demographic, right, um, then to offset that, Biden needs to do even better than he did in 2020 with college-educated suburban men and women, particularly the types of people that probably like Nikki Haley and are supporting her in this primary. And so I do think that that what she does after the election is um, is after this primary is more important than how she conducts herself over the next 24 days really um and I, and i i guess maybe her alone might not matter that much if there are other people of her ilk that do the right thing um but i, I think that that is going to be uh the big question and then also i guess the other contingency there is a third party situation right if there's a third party situation what what people of her of her ilk say is going to matter so, no, I agree with that. I probably overstated my position a little and says that, look, the best thing is, is she does not endorse Trump. That swamps everything else in terms of her having a salutary effect. I think the odd, I think she said she would. So I kind of was being fatalistic and assuming she would and hoping, right. I would hope she would if she does nominally and grudgingly and un, you know demonstratively as opposed to enthusiastically and actually campaigning for her. So I do think it matters what version of endorsement, if she does endorse, uh, she ends up with. 
But I, I mean, if she decides, but one thing I think that's happening is she's getting pretty angry at Trump and he's attacking her a lot. And the odds of her not endorsing have gone up from, I don't know what, you know, like 1% to 10%, 50, I feel like there's some, you know, this is like, our, we always have the six versus 10% <laughs> question of could, Nikki, could Trump lose the nomination? So I kind of feel like there's some chance that as this thing goes on, she gets kind of carried along by the momentum. And maybe she says, you know what? The way he's behaved, this criminal trial that's coming up, I'm, I'm just going to withdraw, withhold my endorsement for a while. Something like that would be good and, and pretty big. So, but I'm sort of struck just from talking to people, and maybe it's a tiny self selected group, obviously, that the fact that she's standing up to him and that she's provoked him and he's attacking her in really stupid ways and attacking someone who's a, you know, if you're sort of a Republican voter who's queasy about Trump, it's still Republican ish. This is kind of what you want it's not like attacking joe biden it's not like attacking us it's not like attacking you know i mean i i think i just think she's doing some damage to trump and obviously much much better though if she ends up not endorsing him um concur okay last topic um i want to get to uh i, I don't know there's a ton new to discuss on this but I, I it's just too important to not keep bringing up um we have the situation with ukraine which for some reason is tied to immigration um, we had James Lankford out over the weekend on the Sunday shows, uh, conducting himself pretty well, I might say. Uh, I, I, I did not like his answer to the question about E. Jean Carroll um, and whether he'd still support Donald Trump. But at least on the subject matter of this debate, um, he was pretty harsh with his colleagues, you know, who were basically saying, hey, you know, those of us who wanted to fund Ukraine, um, we didn't like some of the funding decisions that were being made, particularly on our own border. And so we held this line and said, we have to fix that. Um, in order to get this passed. And now, you know, we're about ready to be able to do that. And we've come up to, with an agreement. And and now you're saying, no, well, you know, now we got to move the goalposts again because whatever, we might make Mr. Trump mad. So uh, Langford clearly still wants to do it, at least at some level, or else he would have been out there. He's been censured by his, the Oklahoma party before the Oklahoma party even got to see, for any of us, even, even got to see the exact um, language in this bill, um, which is... Uh, Pretty telling for the nihilistic GOP that didn't even have a platform in 2020. Um, AB had another great article in the board this week, which was, you know, basically about Mitch McConnell. And um, these are probably his last days um, anyway. And this is his moment. Like he has to do something. He has to st st step up and try to push this through and try to get the 10 votes. Maybe it dies in the House anyway. But I don't know. What have, are you? Have you been talking to anybody uh, about any of this? And what what's your sense of the state of affairs? And and how in a state are you about the behavior of the Republican senators? I mean, I'm in a state because it's been four months ago. The aid to Ukraine should have been renewed or 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 updated, so to speak, or there should have been the new aid package. And then once Israel was attacked, there should have been a package for the Israel and Taiwan as well, and border money. And then if they want to do the border reform, fine. But it's dragged on a long time. And I do think there's some bad faith among some of the Republicans, not Langford. I think McConnell needs to try to help Langford. He's, on, he's with Langford on this. So I'll push this to a conclusion. If they can get the whole package and get 75 votes, that's fine. If they can get Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan only and get 60 votes, from my point of view, that's fine. And they should be able to either way. And they need to then just go to the, you know, really push it in the House and not just let Johnson slow walk, you know, walk it or threaten it as best position. Biden at some point has to really make this, uh, I think, a, it's a fundamental moment. Ukraine's fundamental. And look, honestly, if Biden can get, and this is why Trump's so upset about it, and, and, and so the Republicans in the House, if he can get tough border provisions, whatever their individual merits, combined with Ukraine aid, and then just say, this is, I'm for it. This is what I'm doing. I'm tight, toughing the border and I'm funding, funding Ukraine. It's, there's some of these Republicans who don't want to do either. It's a pretty good issue for Biden, actually. I think he's been, he's held back because he doesn't want to, you know, give the, he doesn't want to politicize it from his point of view yet. But of course, Trump is already from his point of view. So, I mean, the bad faith of Trump is beyond right, and and, and the sort of border hawk Republicans is 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 a little jaw dropping, even by Washington D.C. standards. It's an existential crisis, the worst thing that's ever happened. People are streaming across the border. Oh, blah 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 blah. Death. Biden gets an amazing yeah. amount. Biden ends up endorsing something that's to the right in some ways of things Trump didn't do you know mm -hmm. and 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 instead of saying okay we won that one and then gloating about it which you know they they, they i'm sorry it's not enough it's not good enough you know yeah well it's because they don't want to govern right I, this is what it comes down to they're not interested in governing they don't want to win Go, winning getting policy wins is a loss 
in MAGA right. world because then right. you have to defend it because somebody, some asshole can always say that it was too big of a, right. you know, uh, you, know you, you gave too much to the Democrats. You know, it was too big of a cave to the establishment, to the elites, to Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, right? Like, like you can always get attacked for that. And so doing anything is point it does is is a net negative for you in MAGA world. Like doing nothing and criticizing people trying to do stuff is always a net positive because of the nihilistic nature of MAGA. And so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I talked to with Jake Auchincloss. People miss that um, over on the feed. Um, uh, and and he wants the Democrats to take more of a hard line on this. And I think that that's right. And and if it can get through the Senate, the Democrats do have real leverage because the Republicans literally can't do anything without Democrats. Right. So then the question is, if the Democrats refuse to bail them out without some combination of this deal, you know, I mean, then we're in a government shutdown uh, situation and then, you know, there's the blame game on who's, who it is to blame. But uh, it's the Republicans that are running the House. So I think that's a decent hand, at least for the Democrats to try to play. To do that, I mean, it's 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 truly unbelievable that we're in the situation where our ally absolutely needs assistance now. There is a super majority, I think. In both chambers, probably just in a clean vote. Like if you just brought up a clean vote, right. you'd probably get 65 senators, uh, at like 300 least. in the House, more than that, likely. Right. So you have a maybe not a super majority, but a very clear majority in both chambers for it and for it not to happen, for us to leave them hanging out to dry because something, something we're wor they're worried that, that, you know, it might make Mr. Trump mad or it might get them in trouble on Bannon's war room. I, it's just, it's, it's a preposterous place to be in. It is. And enraging. The party is, is, it's Trump's party, and it's a party that wants to use immigration as a bludgeon and not deal with the problem, as you said, not govern in any way responsibly on that. And that some of whom are really are anti-Ukraine, and they're thrilled to have this sort of twofer, right? right? Yeah. The ones that have to be blamed, this is where the, at some point, some responsible Republicans, you know, I have to, such a, I feel like I've said this an awful lot in the last seven years, have to step up and say- That they're the ones that matter. We we have we have to keep saying it because they're the ones that matter, right? Or or leave, or leave, or become Democrats, or, or just become MAGA, right? But it's just like, I, I don't, I was watching the stupid hearing, or, and, or then I'll close this down, <laughs> but I was watching the stupid China hearing today, a little bit of it. Uh, Mike Gallagher and Pompeo's there, and 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 they're lecturing. Pompeo and and Gallagher are lecturing, Auchin Claus previously mentioned, and some of the other Democrats for like asking partisan questions about Trump's relationship with Xi and about and about the insurrection and and like I, you know uh, if if we care that much about at least and and Gallagher and Pompeo are trying to get on their high horse about how this is bipartisan and 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 how you know we if we cared about our institutions everyone should lock hands and realize the threat from China and it's like these assholes who do not like are doing where are they like we know that Mike Pompeo and Mike Gallagher cared at least. Maybe they don't care deeply. They clearly don't care deeply enough, but they at least believe that we should be defending Ukraine. And and I sense that they probably both believe we should have border security, and they both believe that we should have Taiwan money and Israel money. Like they, they believe all this. Where are these people? They're well, nowhere. They, there's they, no. They're nowhere. I didn't see the hearing, but I saw some clips. They but they say it too. They're for on the record as being yeah. for you know aiding Ukraine, and on the record as for this particular deal. But they're for tougher border security. And then they, but then they just have spent most of their time attacking the Biden administration for various things. You know, some of them maybe legitimate. And basically, you say the key is they're not doing anything to get it done. Right. Not really putting themselves on the line. Mike Gallagher could say, "I'm going to sign a discharge petition to make sure there's aid for Ukraine," because one of the reasons is that, well, not, not aiding Ukraine will not just help Putin; it will help Xi. And I'm a huge yeah. Trump. Yeah, I'll put Taiwan in there. Petition. We'll throw Taiwan in there. On yeah. the discharge petition. So yeah. it helps. Yeah, you know, we'll do the whole bill. Well, that's what I'm thinking. The yeah. Russia, the Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel bill. And I'm going to sign a, you don't know quite what they'd be discharging, but let's assume that that's the bill. And I'm going to sign that on March 10th if the leadership here does not get us a vote on the floor on some version and combination of these bills, whether separately or together, right? He could say that. And they could get five Republicans to say it. They get 213 Democrats and they would have total leverage. It's not that hard, right? And the same with my, Mitt Romney and nine Republican senators. So we're going to have 60 votes for. Any combination you want of these different bills right. together, separate, you know, but we want the aid for Taiwan, uh, Ukraine, above all, and Israel, also strong, important, and we want some border, whatever border yeah. security deal is.
But they leave it to Matt Gates. Only Matt Gates does it. Okay. Uh, on this very same topic, I had been brewing on. I've just I've been brewing and stewing in rage about West Virginia Senator Shelley Moore Capito. And so, if you want to hear me rant about West Virginia Se- Shelley Moore Capito, I just want to let you know that I'm I'm bo- my, I'm boiling over, and I'm going to let it. I'm going to let it continue to to boil overnight. Bubble. I'm going to let it bubble overnight, and tomorrow on the next level. I'm going to save it for that so you can tune in uh, to the Next Level feed here on our here on YouTube or uh, on the Next Level podcast feed where we're now putting this show as well. So uh, come back for that. I'll be with JVL and Sarah. Um, but uh, in the meantime, Bill, any final any final thoughts, any final no, words no, of wisdom from what your friend Wyclef Jean? I like look forward to your denunciation of Shelley Moore Capito. And I'll be just, I know that's been a great show. I'm going to listen to some Taylor now, listen to some Wyclef, you know, kind of my, you know, my friends, you know, my buddies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a thinking of tweeting. What, what do you think I should? Softly, a little bad blood, you know, whatever. Let me ask you this. Should I tweet something? Since they're all obsessed with the conspiracy and, you know, deep ops and we're a deep state and Taylor Swift. Should I say something about how, you know, it's fortunate that they don't realize that Taylor Swift is actually Jim Swift, our colleague's little sister. Yeah, I was tempted to do it. And then I thought, you know what, Taylor Swift, maybe like the, if you say that, like, it'd be bad for various reasons. I don't know. The Swifts, there are a lot of Swifts out there. So there that, that, could, that, could create, that could create some trouble. I'd ask Jim for his permission instead of me. Guys, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow on this feed for the next level with JBL and Sarah. Talk to you next Tuesday with Bill. Peace.